outlook of the country. He was given short shrift. I remember Dominic Raab saying quite clearly, your policies are an electoral suicide note, is how he described it. Uh, the members of the party didn't uh, believe them, but goodness me how that played out in the ensuing weeks. And I think the question as well is that Liz Truss uh, put together in terms of her cabinet a band of believers. And the question was really, did she have an other voices around that table uh, that counselled her for caution? She didn't take that counsel and she got booted out very quickly. And you were talking earlier as well about whether there'll be any acknowledgement or regrets responsibility taken or an apology from Liz Truss because it is you know as you were saying Beth quite astonishing you know they had an 80 seat majority uh, that's now turned into a 36 point Labour lead in the polls the Bank of England stepping in to take emergency action to stop a run on pensions after that budget losing her chancellor you turning on the budget do you think that there will be perhaps uh, a glimmer of recognition uh, of what's happened in the last few months or do you think that she will be perhaps uh, more likely uh, to try and say what she was trying to do? Well, I've actually just got a readout here of, of what she said in Cabinet today, so maybe that's a clue of some of the things she might say. I think she's coming out... Uh, she's probably coming out in, in, in a minute or so, but it, it, in Cabinet today, she talked about, in a short space of time, what her government had achieved. She might talk about the energy bill again, uh, talk about the NI cut. Um, and she also talked about uh, she also thanked her team her deputy prime minister thanking the team for delivering in a difficult time she set out the priorities that she still cares about high energy bills cutting taxes and putting in a plan uh, for patients for the nhs um, and she concluded this by saying her time in the role had been a huge privilege and her successor will have the support as they now build on the important steps already taken by her cabinet to support the country. So perhaps from Liz Truss, a call from unity after she, like Boris Johnson, was taken out of number 10. As Boris Johnson said, when the herd moves, it moves. It does. It's astonishing as well, just looking at the you know, cabinet readout that you've just given us, the second sentence saying, her saying that in the short term the government had been in place, they'd secured some significant achievements. Um, the fact that she's the shortest serving Prime Minister uh, in modern times, and yet she's talking about the significant achievements, perhaps someone who's trying to dig in uh, and talk about, I guess, trying to talk up the Premiership as, as much as possible despite the circumstances they find themselves in. Well, I think there are two achievements that she would point to. One was the energy support plan, which she talked about uh, in her resignation street, and the second was cutting national insurance. That was a rise introduced by Rishi Sunak uh, to fund the health service and social care. It was deeply unpopular with many Conservative uh, MPs because it broke the manifesto pledges, and they didn't like it, and, and I think that hurt Rishi Sunak in the end, and it benefited Liz Truss that she said she was reversing it. So she has got two things that she would point to. Of course she's going to want to do that, just as Boris Johnson tried to point to his successes and gloss over uh, some of the things that went wrong for him uh, when he was Prime Minister. I think the question is really as well is uh, whether Rishi Sunak now begins to reverse anything she did. Does he bring an NI rise back into place or does he let that now lie? It was interesting yesterday that in his very short speech outside in uh, Conservative campaign headquarters, he talked about sticking to the 2019 manifesto because something else that Liz Trump did and actually one of the things that undid her that fracking vote was Liz Truss trying to comes. go on beyond the man. She's come out. Let's listen in. It has been a huge honour to be Prime Minister of this great country. In particular, to lead the nation in mourning the death of Her Late Majesty the Queen after 70 years of service and welcoming the accession of His Majesty King Charles III. In just a short period, this government has acted urgently and decisively on the side of hard-working families and businesses. We reversed the national insurance increase. We helped millions of households with their energy bills and helped thousands of businesses avoid bankruptcy. We are taking back our energy independence, so we are never again beholden to global market fluctuations or malign foreign powers. 
from my time as Prime Minister, I am more convinced than ever that we need to be bold and confront the challenges that we face. As the Roman philosopher Seneca wrote, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it's because we do not dare that they are difficult. We simply cannot afford to be a low growth country where the government takes up an increasing share of our national wealth and where there are huge divides between different parts of our country. We need to take advantage of our Brexit freedoms to do things differently. This means delivering more freedom for our own citizens and restoring power to democratic institutions. It means lower taxes so people can keep more of the money that they earn. And it means delivering growth that will lead to more job security, higher wages and greater opportunities for our children and grandchildren. Democracies must be able to deliver for their own people. We must be able to outcompete autocratic regimes where power lies in the hands of a few. And now more than ever, we must support Ukraine in their brave fight against Putin's aggression. Ukraine must prevail, and we must continue to strengthen our nation's defences. That's what I have been striving to achieve, and I wish Rishi Sunak every success for the good of our country. I want to thank Hugh, Francis Liberty, my family and friends, and all the team at Number 10 for their love, friendship and support. I also want to thank my protection team. I look forward to spending more time in my constituency and continuing to serve South West Norfolk from the backbenches. Our country continues to battle through a storm. But I believe in Britain. I believe in the British people. And I know that brighter days lie ahead. Thank you. Their short speech, she now walks off the waiting car with her husband, followed by her two daughters. And really a speech sticking to her message, focusing on growth, focusing on low tax, talking about it is because we do not dare to do, th do things that things are difficult. She did say that she wishes. They're leaving. Um, she had her daughters with her, um, Francis and Liberty, her two teenage daughters there with her husband Hugh. And she thanked her family and she thanked her team in number 10 for all their love and support. And I think, what did we see from Liz Truss there? Well, really, it was a speech reiterating, I think, what her agenda for government was, what her political philosophy was, what that agenda was that she wasn't able to actually implement. I think there was a little bit more of who Liz Truss was as a politician and wanted to be. She spoke about a Roman philosopher saying that they wrote, not because things are difficult, we do not dare. It's because we do not dare that they are difficult. And in a way, that was the philosophy, wasn't it, of her leadership. I remember when Liz Truss first came into number 10 and I was phoning around lots of her aides uh, and allies and politicians ahead of her taking up the reins at number 10. They said, expect shock and awe. Liz Truss is going to come in. She thinks the economy is stagnating because of Treasury orthodoxy. She's going to be radical. She's going to do things differently. And she's going to try and get that target of 2.5% growth. And there she was really reiterating that philosophy, that you have to take difficult decisions. She said, lower taxes, I want that to keep people with more money. And uh, some of her cabinet, actually the whole cabinet are now uh, coming out, a group of them, Jeremy Hunt there, we expect him to remain as Chancellor, James Heapy just walking down the street, Kemi Badenoch, who we also think could be in. Uh, the Cabinet have just come out. I think later today, Sophie, we're going to get more of the Cabinet uh, arrivals back in the new Cabinet for Sunak. And it'll be interesting to see that as well, won't it? Beth, just reflecting on the Liz Truss speech, 
No, she was really sticking to her message, wasn't she, on, on growth, on lower taxes, uh, saying that she acted urgently and decisively. I just wonder, people listening, uh, you know, at a time when we're seeing rocketing mortgage bills, she resigned after 45 days, she was forced to junk her entire budget. Do you think that people might be surprised that there wasn't, I guess, more acknowledgement uh, of the extraordinary premiership that she's had, rather than sticking to the message that she's always maintained? I think there was an opportunity there for Liz Truss to do what she actually did uh, on the media on the Monday after Jeremy Hunt junked her entire budget and said, I am sorry for the mistakes I made. You did not see that uh, at the podium. There was no, I am sorry if your life... Penny Morden, come, Penny, Mor Penny Morden coming out and also Wendy Morton there, um, the, f the former chief... Well, she's actually still chief whip. I don't imagine she'll remain uh, Rishi Sunak's chief whip. Um, but anyway, um, yes, just going back to what she said, it was very Boris Johnson-esque in that way, but a different style to Liz Truss. But it, that doesn't surprise me, really. I was thinking about this last night, and really Rishi Sunak is a return uh, to more politics as usual in terms of how a prime minister might conduct themselves. If you think about Boris Johnson, he was a populist. Uh, he had this popular appeal. Uh, he liked to break the rules. Uh, he to his critics, showed scant regard for rules and, and, in the end, that was his undoing. Liz Truss was ideological, really, in her pursuit of what she wanted to do and quite a radical. Uh, Rishi Sunak is a different type of politician, so it doesn't surprise me uh, that Liz Truss uh, was quite like Boris Johnson in, uh, sorry, in, in, in talking about her wins and glossing over her losses. Thank you very much. We'll have more uh, with Beth uh, in a moment. Uh, Liz Truss now travelling to the final audience with the King. We can bring in our events commentator, uh, Alistair Bruce. Uh, and Alistair, after the speech that we just had in number 10, uh, she is all the way quickly to go and see uh, the King. Uh, what should she expect? The Prime Minister's coming in now to the quadrangle at Buckingham Palace and for a moment of punctuation, the political story pauses while the constitutional one takes the centre of that national stage. Inside the quadrangle, the car will draw up outside the King's door, which is on the right of the palace as we look from above. And when it comes to a halt, the footman will open the door and waiting for the Prime Minister will be the King's Equerry, Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson, and also the King's Principal Private Secretary, Sir Clive Alderson. And it is, in essence, the end of her period as Head of Government. With her husband and the chance, therefore, after the formal audience for Hugh O'Leary and probably the two daughters to go in and spend time with the King. But inside the palace now, once the welcome has been done, the Prime Minister will be taken to where the King waits. And after the King gives instruction, the equerry will take the Prime Minister to the door. It will be opened and the equerry will stand there, as we have seen on previous occasions, and say to the king, the Prime Minister, Your Majesty. And then within the 1844 room, which is overlooking the garden at the back of Buckingham Palace, it will be the duty of the Prime Minister to inform the king formally that she no longer has the support of her party, that she is no longer the leader of the party, and consequently, she can no longer continue as his Prime Minister. She will then give advice based upon what we all witnessed, that Rishi Sunak is now the leader and that she believes, as Prime Minister, he would be the best person for the King to call as the next Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury. Now, of course, we know so much of this, but the constitutional formality here at Buckingham Palace is a reminder that the monarch is the head of state and prime ministers serve as head of government, not only at the king's pleasure, but 
at the pleasure of that point of holding the majority of opinion within the House of Commons. The King is, in essence, the executive of the nation, but always on the advice of the Cabinet. And so once the formality has been done and the burden of responsibility is over, uh, the King will then call in Hugh O'Leary and anybody else that the former Prime Minister has invited to come to, and the King will receive them. And in due course, Liz Truss will leave under her own direction to whatever plans she has. But the formality of the arrival of a Prime Minister here at Buckingham Palace is now done. And the moment the King is content and the process is done, the King will ask his principal private secretary, Sir Clive Alderton, to call Rishi Sunak to Buckingham Palace. And that process, of course, is all stood by and ready, but the function of it again reminds us that while leaders of the government come and go, the king holds the deep keel of the national constitution and that process is taking place. Of course, for the king, he is taking leave now of the service of Queen Elizabeth II's last prime minister of 13 and of his first prime minister. And it's only a short period that the king has had the benefit of Liz Truss as his principal advisor. They've held a few audiences. And for the king, it was his constitutional right to be informed, to advise and to warn. And that process, I'm sure, may have taken place. It is only for the future for us to find out what gentle advice maybe was given by the king during this process. But for this particular moment, for Liz Truss, currently meeting the king and instructing His Majesty that she can no longer hold the position as his Prime Minister, offering resignation and also giving the name of Rishi Sunak to be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom for the King to call as the second Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury of his reign. so much, uh, Alistair. We'll have more from uh, Alistair uh, as the morning goes on. Liz Truss meeting King Charles for the very last time as Prime Minister. He will shortly have his audience with Rishi Sunak later on uh, today. We'll bring you uh, all of that and go back to Alistair Bruce uh, as well. Uh, meanwhile, uh, here in Downing Street, uh, I feel like uh, people perhaps still digesting uh, that uh, speech from Liz Truss, the Prime Minister who resigned after just 45 days forced to junk her entire budget, and yet seemingly doubling down uh, on her economic plan, saying that they can't afford to be a low-growth country and even calling for lower taxes. Let's bring our political editor, uh, Beth Rigby, uh, back in, uh, shall we? Uh, and really, in many ways, Beth, it feels, as she goes to uh, meet King Charles for the very last time, uh, an outgoing uh, Prime Minister digging in, at saying not really acknowledging that she got anything wrong, despite the circumstances. Yeah, look, it was a speech. That speech was just over three minutes. So, again, very short. I mean, double the amount of time that she uh, spent talking about her resignation. Um, but in it, if I was to sum it up um, succinctly, I would say it was a reiteration of her own agenda and political philosophy. There was no regret or ap apology for mistakes made uh, that brought about economic chaos uh, for many uh, people that led to rising mortgage uh, deals, uh, rising inflation, uh, worries over pension funds, forcing the Bank of England to step in with that 45 billion emergency package in order to stabilise uh, some pension funds. There was no admission uh, of some of the mistakes she made instead. And this was quite Johnsonian. Uh, in terms of both the style, but also quoting a Roman philosopher, uh, quoting him saying, I think it's Seneca, saying it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it's because we do not dare that they are difficult. And really, what is that summing up? It's summing up her belief that her 
policy strategy was correct, the execution was wrong. And that will be the legacy of Liz Truss, that the policy was wrong and it created turmoil, which basically kicked her out of number 10. And now she has left it to her successor, Rishi Sunak, to try to pick up the pieces. Uh, she wishes him every success, and it does feel like uh, he might need it, given the uh, economic outlook. Beth, thank you very much for your analysis. More from Beth uh, as uh, the morning uh, goes on. Uh, now, we're joined by Sean Worth. Uh, we can go to our next guest, a former Downing Street advisor, former head of the Conservative Policy Unit, now director of the consultancy WPI uh, Strategy. Um, what did you make uh, of that Liz Truss speech? Um, well, I... I'm the Member of Parliament for South Suffolk, and I was Rishi's PPS uh, when he was Chancellor of Exchequer. Um, and uh, the main comment I wanted to make was, I think, you know, it's incredibly difficult to deliver a speech like that. Um, you know, she, she's had a very difficult and challenging period as Prime Minister, a very short period. Um, but I think what she was saying is, these are my deeply held beliefs, I haven't changed them. Um, and implying that she still has, you know, a future in public life, which of course, um, she does. She will remain a member of parliament. She's a proud East Anglian MP like me. I represent her in Suffolk. She's in Norfolk. Um, and I'm sure we will hear much more from her in the future. But And it's to the future we now look, of course. We're now transitioning to new prime minister, Rishi Sunak. Um, and I think that you've underlined it. The crucial thing him, for him is to bring economic stability, to um, ensure that there is confidence in the country that we are restoring the fundamentals of sound economics. Uh, apologies uh, for the uh, wrong introduction. James Cartledge, of course, the uh, Conservative MP for South at Suffolk. Great to have you on the programme uh, this morning. I feel like it's one of those uh, days, very busy uh, here at Downing Street for us. Um, you're talking there about the Liz Truss speech. I just wonder how you think your constituents uh, might view that speech. You know, this is the woman who effectively crashed the economy. She had to junk her budget. She's become the shortest serving Prime Minister of modern times. And your constituents are paying for it in the form of uh, higher... Uh, mortgage rates uh, as well and yet she's coming there to say that they adapt the government acted urgently and decisively that she was on the side of hard-working people uh, and mm. reiterating the economic strategy that got us into the mess in the first place well, so I, I, I would interpret it as she's saying my beliefs haven't changed now whether that means she's saying the execution was wrong you know I think the point is a, a speech like that is very difficult you know she is at the end of the day a human being who's had a very difficult period ultimately um, has left after a short time in office and I think as I said as I said that she is saying look you know I still have a future in public life and the, these are my core beliefs but uh, in terms of what I say to my constituents and this is what matters to me the businesses in my constituency people with mortgages like you were just talking about um, actually there's some good news which is that there is there is a glimmer of, uh, of of a sign that mortgage rates are starting to stabilise, if not even come down. Some rates have come out today that are lower. I was a mortgage broker before I became an MP, and it's really good to see that. Of course, the fact is interest rates overall are still on an upward path, and um, that's true around the world. And I think that, as I say, the, the really crucial thing now, as, as Rishi Sunak prepares to become our constitutional prime minister, um, going to see His Majesty, is that we need to have a period of stability um, we need to have a period where the public feel we're in control of the economy as best we can and preparing the ground for, for getting back to delivering our 29 manifesto, which we were elected on. Uh, now, you, of course, worked with uh, Rishi Sunak when he was at the Treasury. You backed him uh, during the leadership campaign. What do you think we can expect to see from him as Prime Minister? Because there's going to be difficult decisions ahead. You know, this is your chance to level with people. A tax is going to go up and a spending going to come down. Totally, and I, I think that phrase, level with people, is so important. One thing you will see from Rishi is he will tell it like it is. He will be frank with the British people about the challenges ahead of us. You know, I, I, I'll never forget, I became his PPS just a few days before lockdown, um, and there was that day when he was told, you know, the economy is literally going to be shut down, at least large parts of it. Uh, extraordinarily high-pressured situation, had to act very fast to deliver furlough and all these other schemes. So he's he's got that experience, which I think has been such a crucial factor in the support he's received from the Parliamentary Party, from all wings of the Parliamentary Party. And I think the other thing you'll see today is him drawing on talents from across the party um, because he knows that, you know, in these challenging times, we have to be as unified as possible. But to your point, yes, I think he will be absolutely clear in levelling with the British public and saying to him, these are the difficult choices we face. Um, I'm going to try and carry you with me on that journey. 
OK, well, we'll find out, of course, if he does uh, put together a unity cabinet later on uh, this afternoon. Uh, James Cottledge, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, today. Well, we've been watching, of course, uh, those live pictures from Buckingham Palace, uh, where Liz Truss is currently meeting with the King. We can bring in our events commentator, Alistair Bruce. Alistair. Well, it was the end of the period of Liz Truss as Prime Minister, heading into Buckingham Palace earlier on, and received by members of the royal household. And you do get that sense that the state takes over in terms of the constitutional moment when the head of state, the king, uh, passes power from one politician to another. And many people ask what would happen in the interim if anything happened to the United Kingdom. And of course, there will always be cover because this is cabinet government that the United Kingdom has. The prime minister is but one member of the cabinet but the secret's in the name. The Prime Minister is the one who answers to the monarch and who therefore takes from the monarch the right to put together what that executive is. And it will not be until a new Prime Minister is in place that all those other cabinet ministers are changed. And again, that process is done through the King. But at Buckingham Palace at the moment, I'm sure that the moment of resignation has taken place. The naming of Rishi Sunak formally as the person that the former Prime Minister suggests the King calls as the next Prime Minister will have taken place. And it all gets much more relaxed then. And the King will press the buzzer and in will come Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson, the King's query, with members of the party who came with Liz Truss. And the King will have a chance to just talk about everything and say thank you and perhaps reflect upon quite what a story they have both been through, not only for the nation, but also for the king losing his mother, the queen, and becoming sovereign. And that first week when, as Prime Minister, Liz Truss travelled all across the United Kingdom with the king as he started his reign. But it is much more relaxed at that point. Uh, Alistair, thank you uh, very much. We'll have more from Alistair Bruce, our Royal Events commentator, uh, as the morning goes on. Liz Truss meeting King Charles for the last time as Prime Minister. And he, of course, uh, will shortly, later on this morning, uh, be seeing in the new Prime Minister as well. So we'll bring you all of those events from Buckingham Palace too. My, meanwhile, back here uh, in uh, Downing Street, it's a very busy day uh, on uh, Downing Street. Everyone listening, of course, to the Liz Truss speech, but already, it feels, doesn't it, Beth, uh, after Mr. Beth Beth be here with us throughout, uh, as though minds are turning uh, towards what comes next. We'll be hearing from Rishi Sunak uh, later on today. Um, how do you expect uh, him to hit the ground? Well, I think the first thing to say is that uh, many MPs are happy that this short, disastrous period under Liz Truss is over and they are keen to turn the page. Even those who did not back uh, Rishi Sunak, even those that backed Liz Truss knew uh, towards the second half of just her, what, seven weeks in office, uh, that the game was up, that it was going to be over. It was quite astonishing uh, to see such a fast fall from grace. It will potentially go down as the worst premiership ever. People glad to see the back of that, but goodness me, she has made Rishi Sunak's job uh, even harder now because the economic storms that the country was already facing, triggered by the war in Ukraine, spiking energy prices, the way that that was affecting uh, energy bills, food bills, imports, so rising inflation, then compounded by rising interest rates around the world, the era of cheap money over. These were all constraints on the economy. She then made a series of policy errors, really, that exacerbated those problems and now Rishi Sunak has to put it right. I think there's a couple of things to say about his premiership and what we might expect from him. Number one, yesterday when he spoke as Conservative Party leader, it was very much to the party, we have to unite or die. That was the message, that this party which has seen such awful bloodletting, I can't remember anything like it. I think you might have to go back to maybe the major years with the Brexit wars and I wasn't around. Well, I mean, I was alive, but I wasn't covering... <laughs> I wasn't doing politics back then. I was, I was still a student, actually. Um, but, you know, you, you, the, the sort of bloodletting has been so unpleasant. And the question is, can he put the party back together? And that was the message yesterday. And we can get on to whether he can or can't later. But I think the thing that I want to see today, or I'm expecting to see, has got to talk to the country 
they have got the worst polling that they've seen uh, for many, many years, over a decade. Liz Truss was the most unpopular Prime Minister ever polled. Only one in 10 Britons by the end of it had any confidence in her. He's got a massive credibility gap, not just uh, within the party and, and, you know, belief in the Conservative Party that these guys can get it together, but also in the country. And so what's he going to say on the steps there to try and speak to the country and attempt, and it is an attempt, I don't know if he will succeed, but attempt to reset the agenda and try to close the gap and re-earn the trust of British people that have no doubt looked at what's happened in number 10 in recent weeks and what's happened to their mortgages, what's happened to inflation, what's happened to the economy. He's got to rebuild trust. I mean, economic competence has been the the mantra on which Conservative governments have consistently outpolled Labour and won elections. And now he has to prove to the public that they still earn that title. It's going to be a tough message as well, isn't it, do you think? You know, it's interesting listening to uh, the Rishi Sunak uh, supporter, uh, James Cartledge, talking before about how he was expecting to see Rishi Sunak level with people. And it is going to be tough, isn't it, I guess? Uh, you know, this is a man who, as you say, is all about kind of economic competence. Yeah. Um, how difficult do you think the message is that he's well, got he to give? he did level with people, didn't he, Sophie? He did mm -hmm. level with people during the leadership race and people didn't want to hear it. The members didn't much like it. I should also say, though, that in the leadership race, and this is what some of his allies said to me afterwards, part of the barrier for Rishi Sunak was that because Boris Johnson was so opposed to him, and they calculated that about 30% of the Conservative grassroots were Boris backers, it kind of killed him off before the race even got going. He did manage to close the gap, actually, with members over that uh, summer period. Um, but he did level with people. He said these are hard choices. He said there's not a magic money tree. He said that Liz Truss's policies were economic fancy. He said that you can't cut taxes at the a moment when you have rising inflation because it's inflationary. It puts more money into the economy. It makes it more, it makes the problem bigger, not smaller, right? So he did say all of these things and I think that that's what we're going to get more of. But what's the problem for him? Look, if you look at the public finances, those unfunded tax cuts and the knock-on effect for pushing up the cost of government borrowing because the markets were less confident about the government's long-term fiscal plans has added debt to the balance sheets of the United, United Kingdom government. And it could be that that fiscal black hole that the new Chancellor has now got is even bigger than a few weeks ago. Well, it's not could, it is. It's even bigger uh, than when Liz Truss took office. And there have been estimates from the Institute of Fiscal Studies that that black hole could be £60 billion. Pounds. Now, they reversed £32 billion pounds of tax cuts, so it's smaller. But people have also been saying to me around the Treasury, actually, the recent market turmoil and inflation is pushing it back up. So he's got really, really difficult tax and spend decisions to make. We expect that statement on October the 31st. But what's he going to do about uprating, say, benefits in line with earnings or inflation? Does he drop Liz Truss's defence pledge? How does Ben Wallace feel about that? Does he cut public spending, as she said uh, she would do? I mean, one person familiar with the Treasury said to me the other day, it could be twice as bad in terms of cuts that we saw in the austerity years under George Osborne. I don't know how it will play out, but I'm telling you that in terms of just giving you a flavour of the challenges that he has. And the, the final thing I would say on that is he's only been a politician for seven years, I think, yeah? Came in in 2015. He's 42 years old. He is quite untested. It doesn't mean that he won't make a success of it, but he is quite untested. And he has got the hardest job of any post-war prime minister, really, or certainly any prime minister since in recent decades. And it's made all the harder by the mistakes Liz Truss made. Uh, Beth, thank you very much for your analysis. Beth, they're talking about what to expect uh, from uh, Rishi Sunak when he comes out uh, after his audience uh, with the King uh, as the new Prime Minister here uh, on Downing Street. I have to say, we were expecting him to give a rather different speech to Liz Truss, where she was calling for lower taxes uh, and saying that they need to focus on growth. Rishi Sunak, the message from him, uh, likely to be very contrasting uh, indeed. Well, we're joined now by Sean Worth, who's a former Downing Street advisor, former head of the Conservative Policy Unit, now director of the consultancy WPI Strategy. Thank you very much for 
uh, being with us. Uh, first, shall we reflect on the outgoing uh, Prime Minister, Liz Truss? What did you make of the speech that she gave? Oh, I, I thought it was OK. I mean, it, I think she's in a slightly embarrassing situation, isn't she? She's in the shortest uh, serving Prime Minister. It's all a bit embarrassing. And uh, she looked like somebody who just wants to exit stage as, as quickly as possible because the main act is coming on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I mean, all eyes now on Rishi Sunak. Yeah, all eyes on Rishi Sunak, and he's got a really difficult challenge uh, ahead of him, uh, hasn't he? Uh, the Conservatives absolutely languishing uh, in the polls, a huge budget black hole, public services already squeezed. Do you think he's got any chance of turning things around? I do. I, I mean, everyone at the moment is focusing on policy, and quite rightly, you know, we're in the economic crisis and all of that. Um, his biggest priority right now, though, is is just to get rid of the distraction of the his internal enemies, the right of the Conservative Party. That you know, every time the Tory party seems to be in power, happened when I worked in in the government, um, the right of the party destabilizes it. So he's, he's got to somehow draw a cabinet together that yes includes them but doesn't let them let them dominate things it's no um it's no uh, coincidence that none of them ever tend to appear in cabinet in serious jobs or, or, or feature in election campaigns is because you know broadly that wing of the party isn't particularly well liked and unfortunately there's a lot of them and you've got to you've got to manage them that's your first priority get rid of the distraction then grip the crisis get hold of that economic agenda and deliver a budget that brings the market back to confidence it's interesting talking there about the risks of the right of the party interviewed uh, steve baker at the weekend who said uh, that if rishi sunak kind of rode back on the northern ireland protocol that the erg the right wing a group of Brexiters in the party would implode uh, whoever was the new Prime Minister. Um, how important, with all that in mind, do you think the reshuffle is uh, later? It's massive. You know, Steve Baker actually is... is not one of the most uh, mad figures in the right of the party. I, he's not mad at all, but, you know, the sort of Chris Chokes and... and I, don't, I don't want to start naming people, but you, you know who I mean. Um, you know, these people are in in really safe seats. They never face electoral pressure. I, I genu I've worked with them and I've got friends on that wing of parties. So I'm not being personal, but I genuinely don't think they understand the ordinary, you know, what ordinary people want to see from a Conservative party. We've got a chance in Rishi Sunak, at least, that we didn't have with this trust in trying to broaden appeal beyond the immediate membership. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's got a huge, huge challenge to come. The big, big thing is that those people don't become distraction as he's trying to get a grip on the economic crisis. Because remember, we're only two years away from general election. And the big thing, you know, the, the big message the Tories will be telling people um, is, you know, remember, they've been in power for a long time. So they'll be saying, essentially, and, I, you know, you can quote me on this when it happens, they'll be saying, don't risk change now. We're just getting back on track. You know, we're steadying the ship. There's choppy waters ahead. Stick with us. Us, we're going to see it through and they'll try and present change as i.e the Labour Party coming in as risk and the more that the the internal factions of the Tory party squabble amongst themselves the, the less compelling that will be. Uh, just very briefly um, Rishi Sunak said yesterday that the Conservative Party must unite or die is that an exaggeration or is it true? No, they'll, they'll, wipe, they'll be wiped out if they don't unite. You know, the big issue that they've got is this economic crisis. But remember, this winter we'll probably have an NHS... Well, we'll have an NHS crisis. There is still a housing crisis. There's a social care crisis. There's loads of crises. We just don't talk about them much because there's so much drama going on at the top of politics. But he's, he's going to get all of that landing on his lap um, today, you know. So without a united party trying to steer him through that, and as I say present to the electorate that there's a, there's really choppy waters coming and he's inherited them. He can't blame the Labour Party because it's the Tories that have been in power for 14 years, it'll be by the time of the election. You, you, you know, it, he needs to have a, a decent... to have a decent chance of just holding on to, you know, a reasonable amount of a party and losing an election, he's got to have a united party, not, not just for winning it. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, Sean Worth, uh, thank you very much for being uh, on the programme today. Thank you. We can go back now to our political editor, uh, Beth Rigby. And Beth, it's interesting hearing Sean Worth there talking about the threat to Rishi Sunak from within his own party, how divided uh, they are, and the fact that they will face wipeout of the, the election uh, unless they unite. With all that in mind, how important is the reshuffle, or the shuffle, if you like, the fact that his uh, cabinet appointment is going to be later? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things on that. But the first thing to say in terms of the divisions within the party... Um, he did manage to get, by our, our sky toll, nearly 200 MPs. Now, the parliamentary party's 357. So, 
Um, just to come in very quickly, uh, we can just look just to explain what you're seeing on your screens. It's a removal van uh, outside uh, Downing Street, so brutal uh, as uh, we were reflecting earlier. Uh, you can see there the removal van uh, for uh, Liz Truss as the uh, former Prime Minister or the outgoing Prime Minister leaves uh, and the new one comes in. Uh, Beth, you were talking uh, about uh, how difficult uh, it is for uh, Rishi Sunak uh, to try and unite the party, but the work that he's done so far. Yeah, as I was saying, um, just in terms of where was he with MPs? He had nearly 200 MPs publicly backing him. There was a kind of sense of momentum yesterday that this should be a coronation, not a contest. But it should be said, number one, that Boris Johnson did, according to it being independently verified by the 22 committee, get enough nominations to s s go on the ballot. Why didn't he? Well, I was told by one of his key allies on Sunday night that he was told very clearly that two-thirds of the party simply wouldn't back him. And in that position, even if you can get on the ballot, the party's ungovernable, so he couldn't stand. You then had Penny Morden. Now, I was told yesterday that she got into the early 90s, low 90s, it slightly dropped back, but she was in touching distance of getting onto the ballot and she would have gone for it. And what does that tell you? That there was a sizable chunk of the parliamentary party that did not want Rishi and even were prepared uh, to go for Penny Warden just to have a contest. Now, some of them would have said that's because they want members to have a say, but others will be because they don't like Rishi Sunak. And if you think about what happened back in July and why Rishi Sunak's run at the leadership was kind of dead before it even began, it was because he was considered, for some MPs who are Arch Johnson loyalists, as the guy that brought Boris Johnson down. That's what they think. Now, other people have a different view and say Boris Johnson brought himself down with his own mistakes and missteps. But anyway, you, you, so you have a chunk of the parliamentary party. That's the question. Like, yesterday, everyone kept a low profile and it was all cheers for Rishi Sunak outside of campaign headquarters, Conservative campaign headquarters. But you've got to ask yourself, within that 100 people that apparently wanted to back Boris Johnson, are there 35 to 40 that simply will not support Rishi Sunak? And, and if there are... He's going to find it really hard to get any legislation through Parliament, which is why I go back to the point that he's trying to stick to the 2019 manifesto. There's two reasons for that. One is then it helps the Conservatives to fight off this call for a general election because he's executing the mandate that voters voted for. And, and then the second thing is, is that he's not going to try and create wedges with the parliamentary party on issues that they might not like. So he's quite constrained in that way, I would say. And given how constrained he is and the fact that there are, like you say, like a, a sizable chunk of MPs who didn't back him, um, how do you think he goes about forming a cabinet? Do you think he'll end up bringing in people who backed Boris Johnson, who backed Penny Morden, or do you think he'll be tempted to do as Liz trusted to get the, his lieutenants around him, the people he can trust the most? Well, on the cabinet, that. There was interesting advice from people that hadn't bat Liz Truss that they tried, I think, to feed into Number 10 over the summer, which was that Liz Truss would be unwise to follow a Johnsonian approach to Cabinet appointments, which is basically push out anyone that wasn't an arch-loyalist and surround yourself uh, with your believers. Boris Johnson did that in 2019. Uh, and in a way, he had the right to do that because he'd won an 80-seat majority. I mean, he really was, at that point, world king, mm -hmm. if you like. Liz Truss also tried to do it. People were saying to me before, if she has any hope of trying to bring the party with her, she should build a cabinet uh, which reflects different wings. But I guess from her perspective, her agenda was so radical uh, that she didn't want to have uh, disagreement around the cabinet table. In the end, that was a big mistake because actually what happened was there was no breaks, there was no caution, there was no uh, counter-arguing to some of the policies that brought her down. So that brings you to Rishi Sunak. I don't think he has an option but to have a unity cabinet. And what, what am I looking at? Uh, well, you saw on the right of the party the likes of Swella Bravman and Kemi Badenoch. They would have been the people that maybe would have run against him had the threshold for nominations been lower. Uh, they both endorsed him publicly. Uh, will they be rewarded with returns to Cabinet, into his Cabinet? Um, you've got his key gang, really. I think, I think I've... And as I understand it, uh, Jeremy Hunt is meant to be staying as Chancellor. That's what I learned last night. Uh, I think that that will be the case unless something changes today. And that makes sense because Rishi Sunak doesn't want to unsettle the markets. And Jeremy Hunt has now become <laughs> the voice of calm, hasn't he? 
But then in the wider cabinet, well, who are his gang, if you like, the guys and girls that got him into number 10? You've got Mel Stride, the chair of the Treasury Select Committee. You've got Gavin Williamson, the former chief whip and education secretary. Grant Shapps, now home secretary, a key ally of Rishi Sunak. Will he keep him up? Uh, at home, there's talk that he might. Or will he move Dominic Raab into home, the former foreign secretary and deputy prime minister that stood behind him in July and was summarily kicked out of cabinet and went back to the back benches? So I expect that he will be back uh, too. Um, who else? Who else? I've got other names. Mark Harper, another former chief whip. Um, there's a number of allies that Rishi Sunak uh, will want to reward, but I also think that he will have to try to keep uh, different wings of the party in Cabinet. But something someone else said to me that's close to him and on his team is that what he really needs to do is bring the A game. Because it shouldn't be, at the moment, given what's going on in the country, this is their argument, that you bring in people for political reasons or loyalty reasons, which is what Boris Johnson is like, loyalty above everything else. What you need is competence. Because, actually, as one of the guests was saying, we keep talking about the economy, but the problems of the country are so much bigger than that. Look at the NHS, record waiting lists. It's, you know, people are really unhappy because they can't get doctor's appointments. There's probably, like, education, you know, school funding. How are they going to cope with rising inflation and, and funding day-to-day -day spending on public services? There's so many issues, strikes, public sector pay. I mean, there's so many issues, defence, the war in Ukraine, you know, is there going to be an escalation? I mean, they keep popping into my head, like, the, the inbox is horrific, really. Who would want to be here? And so, so, so he needs, he really does need to put in there an A-game cabinet. And I, I'm really interested to see, this is, for me, the kind of most interesting thing now, how much of a reset is it? And he really needs a reset if he's got any hope of bringing this divided party back together. It really will be. Uh, more from Beth. Uh, as it goes on. We have got uh, communications from uh, Buckingham Palace. The Right Honourable Elizabeth Truss uh, had an audience with the King this morning and tendered her resignation as Prime Minister, which His Majesty was graciously pleased to accept. That in from Buckingham Palace. Good morning. It is 11 o'clock. Liz Truss has left number 10, just behind us, as Prime Minister for the last time. And in the last hour, she made a short resignation speech before heading to Buckingham Palace to tender her resignation to King Charles. When in a few minutes' time, we're expecting to see her successor, Rishi Sunak, arriving at the palace, where he'll then be formally invited to form a new administration. We will bring you live coverage throughout the rest of the morning. First, though, let's listen, shall we, again, to what Liz Truss said in that final speech as Prime Minister. It has been a huge honour to be Prime Minister of this great country, in particular to lead the nation in mourning the death of Her Late Majesty the Queen after 70 years of service and welcoming the accession of His Majesty King Charles III. In just a short period, this government has acted urgently and decisively on the side of hard-working families and businesses. We reversed the national insurance increase. We helped millions of households with their energy bills and helped thousands of businesses avoid bankruptcy. We are taking back our energy independence, so we are never again beholden to global market fluctuations or malign foreign powers. From my time as Prime Minister, I am more convinced than ever that we need to be bold and confront the challenges that we face. As the Roman philosopher Seneca wrote, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it's because we do not dare that they are difficult. We simply cannot afford to be a low growth country where the government takes up an increasing share of our national wealth and where there are huge divides between different parts of our country. We need to take advantage of our Brexit freedoms to do things differently. This means delivering more freedom for our own citizens and restoring power to democratic institutions. It means lower taxes so people can keep 
more of the money that they earn. And it means delivering growth that will lead to more job security, higher wages. Uh, that is the live shot uh, that you can see there uh, of Rishi Sunak. Uh, Rishi Sunak expected to leave Downing Street shortly and to travel to Buckingham Palace. Uh, we can bring uh, Beth Rigby uh, in. We are poised uh, on that shot to wait and see uh, the next uh, Prime Minister. Uh, it really is kind of like a roller coaster morning, isn't it? Uh, Liz Truss formally tending her resignation to King Charles. He's accepted it. Currently, there's no Prime Minister. Well, Rishi Sunak's about to become uh, the Prime Minister. He's just about to have his audience uh, with the Queen. And for him, uh, this really is... I was writing about it last night. It feels like something out of, uh, of the West Wing, doesn't it? The drama, the plot twists, uh, the infighting. I mean, you couldn't make it up in terms of... Uh, art imitating life, if you like, or life rather imitating art. Uh, this guy uh, was basically down and out. You know, he'd blown it, if you like. He tried to run as prime minister. Uh, people always say you only really get one shot. You only get one chance uh, to either win the members over or you don't. He was four, he's 42 years old, seven years uh, in parliament. And he must have thought um, at the end of August into September, well, my political career is over, what do I do next? And 